Well, good morning and welcome to our daily devotion from St. Swithin's Church, Pimble. The divine speech in Job chapter 38 has been compared to the lists uh, the ancient Egyptians used to make. Lists of names like catalogues that start with heaven and the stars, deal with meteor meteorological phenomena like rain and thunder, um, the earth and water, people and their occupations, towns and buildings, land and products, and end with uh, parts of animals. This tradition of list making was also known from Mesopotamia, where there are lists of trees, domestic and wild animals, birds and fish. These lists were viewed as displays of wisdom in the ancient world. Sometimes they were lists without elaboration that simply showed a wide knowledge of objects in a, in a, a similar category. More important though, they showed insight into how things work, their habits and routines. The presence of such a list in Job chapter 38, therefore, indicates that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is showcasing his wisdom. Chapter 38 emphasizes God as the creator. Here God describes creation like the construction of a building. And in verses four to six, refers to the foundation and the cornerstone of that building being laid. God highlights the fact that Job wasn't present at the creation of the world. Where were you when I laid earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? Though the building blocks are being put in place, the interest is on how Yahweh has set up the ordered cosmos to operate at his command. It is God who set the boundaries for the sea and restricted its movements. This is significant because in the ancient Near Eastern cosmology, the sea is the symbol of chaos. So in other words, God's command of the sea shows he is clearly in control. Of course, that has significance when you come to the New Testament and you see Jesus uh, calming the waters uh, in that huge storm in the Lake of Galilee. In verse 15, it is God who denies the wicked their light. Now the symbolism of light versus darkness was common in the ancient Near East, especially when it intended to highlight a deity's power. Darkness is a time of danger, but when light appears or the sun rises, the threat of harm is alleviated. God's rhetorical questions uh, to Job move into the astronomical realm in verses 31 to 33. He asks Job, can you bind the chains of Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Of course, the answer to all these questions is obviously no. In chapter 39, God's rhetorical questions move into the realm of the animal kingdom. Does Job know how animals hunt and give birth? Or from where their strength and movement come? Only God, as Lord of animals, a familiar art motif in the ancient world, can control the animals. But as Lord, of, as Lord of animals, the God of the Bible does not destroy the animals, but rather takes care of them. Even the lion and raven are fed. Their young are said to cry out to God for food and it is God who provides for them. 
There's a brief break in this line of argument in verses 1 to 7 of chapter 40. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. In verse 10, God challenges Job to dress himself in glory, which is ironic given that that is something only God can do. In the Psalms and earlier in Job, we read that God is clothed with splendor and majesty. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, Matthew records that Jesus told his disciples to look at the birds of the air. In doing so, he wasn't encouraging, encouraging them to become ornithologists, but to constantly be reminded by them that they had a Father in heaven who cares and provides, even for the seemingly insignificant birds of the air. Here in chapter 40, verse 15 of Job, God tells Job to look at behemoth. Now the background to this is that most of the ancient world believed in chaos creatures, creatures that were outside of the established order. These creatures were often viewed as a threat to the established order. In contrast, however, the Hebrew Bible consistently expresses God's control over chaos creatures and merges them into the created, into the ordered cosmos. For example, they're said to be created, which draws them into the ordered cosmos. And they're passive rather than threatening. Non-zoological creatures such as behemoth, leviathan, and Rahab are not viewed in the Bible as unbridled threats, but neither are they drawn totally into the ordered sphere. Significant problems exist for the suggestions that behemoth and Leviathan are either zoological specimens or now extinct creatures that once roamed the earth. In the former category, while behemoth's location among the lotus plants in the reeds of the marsh verses 21 to 24, might bring to mind the mighty hippopotamus. The description of its tail swaying like a mighty cedar in verse 17 makes such identification problematic. Likewise, those who suggest some huge, now extinct plant-eating dinosaur would have trouble explaining how it's concealed among the lotus plants. All told, God asks Job 49 questions about the natural universe, many of them starting with, do you know? It's almost as if God is lovingly teasing Job with his tongue-in-cheek comments like, surely you know, tell me if you know it all. As Nicky Gumbel points out in his commentary, God's questioning is to demonstrate the fact that there are certain things that we do not know as human beings. These are the secret things that belong to the Lord our God. This is especially true in relation to the issue of suffering. Theologians and philosophers have wrestled for centuries with the problem of suffering, and no one has ever come up with a simple and complete solution. The book of Job is not so much about why God allows suffering as it is about the appearance of God in the midst of suffering and about how we should respond to suffering. When we're suffering, we'll not always be able to work out why. I'm asking that question myself right now as I record this in the family room of the Royal North Shore Hospital. God never told Job why he was suffering, even though we know part of the answer from the start of the book. But he did tell them 
that there was a good reason. God pointed out to Job that he really knew very little about the universe and asked him to trust the one who does. In tomorrow's passage, we'll see that Job recognised that there are some things too wonderful for him to know. In other words, there are some things that we are never going to know in this life. On the other hand, uh, there are some things that we can know. Job says, I know you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Verse 2. We can know that God is ultimately in control and therefore we can live at peace and confidently trust that in everything, as it says in Romans 8, 28, God will work for the good of those who love him. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Please help us to have humility about the secret things that we cannot know and to be confident about the things that we can know. And please grant us the grace and strength we need in times of suffering and trouble. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. May God bless you today.